I'm John Hemingway. Welcome back to Shropshire. Now this is part two of our video on anthelmintic resistance, wormer resistance, which is a topic that you requested, so we're doing it. Now, in the first part of the video, we talked about how resistance develops, the actual mechanism of it. And we talked about how you test to see what the resistance status of the worms on your farm is. If you haven't watched that video, it might be worth going back and watching that first. This one will make more sense. But now we have established that the development of resistance is actually inevitable. In this video, we will talk about the practices that you can employ to slow down the development of that resistance and keep our anthelmintics effective on your farm for as long as possible. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Okay, so we've already spoken about how resistance develops and we understand that a bit of resistance develops to a wormer every time we use it. So in very simple terms, the way to slow down the development of that resistance is just to use our wormers less. Reduce the number of times that the worms on your farm are exposed to anthelmintics. So how are we going to do that? Well, before we start, we talked last time about establishing the status of the resistance picture on your farm, knowing what resistance levels you have to which products. And I can't stress enough how important that is. So the first thing that you should do is carry out a drench efficacy test on your three main wormers. Second to that, when was the last time you actually properly calibrated your dosing equipment? Underdosing lambs use is a really good way to develop resistance quickly. All you've got to do, use your dosing gun to draw up a particular dose, squirt it into a measuring cylinder or even easier into a syringe with the plunger pulled out. Is it dispensing the amount that it is supposed to? Are you dosing your animals properly or are they being underdosed? The next thing, and we've talked about this an awful lot before, fecal egg counts. If you do fecal egg counts on a monthly basis throughout the grazing season, then you're going to pick up worm egg levels rising before they get to a level which causes you a problem. But in this circumstance, we're talking about reducing our wormer use. So the benefits of using fecal egg counts are that actually you'll say, OK, the egg levels haven't increased. I would normally have wormed about now. I don't need to. I'll recheck in three or four weeks. But right now, I can save that wormer and you have not exposed those worms to anthelmintic that they didn't need to see. Alongside basing our worming decisions on fecal egg counts, we can base them on weight gain. So if you've got the capacity to weigh lambs as they come through a race and you've got a crush, perhaps it's an AID one that's going to throw up their weights as they come through, well yes, we can say, okay, this lamb is growing fine. It doesn't need worming. Certain animals, depending on their genetics, will sustain a good daily live weight gain even if they're carrying a moderately high worm burden. And those are animals that we don't need to treat. Again, there are worms in those animals that we can avoid exposing to the wormer because the animal doesn't need it. And this plays in to the Scots principle of leaving a certain proportion, 5%, 10%, of your animals untreated. It means that you're not exposing as many of the worms on your farm to a wormer at any one time. Next, we're going to talk about which wormer we should use. This is where knowing the resistance status on your farm at the time of year is important. If we know that a particular wormer is not effective, well, of course, we're not going to rely on them. When you're making this decision, you have to bear in mind what you know you've already got resistance to on your farm, and you have to bear in mind what you've already used this year. We don't want to drive the same wormer into the ground by using it repetitively year on year. We're going to have that discussion with our vet, with our SQP, and be sure that you know which products with different brand names are actually different active ingredients. 
So next, I've got to advocate the use of the group four and five wormers. These are the orange wormers and the purple wormers. These are the very highly efficacious wormers. And we can use these at the appropriate time to avoid the repeated use of one of the three traditional wormers. We know that it's going to work. It's going to clear those lambs out. The other time that we need to use those group four and five products is during quarantine. Now, the quickest way to get resistance on your farm is to buy it in. If you buy in animals carrying resistant worms, you're just going to bring those worms onto your farm and give yourself resistance very rapidly. So you have to be using one of these two products as part of your quarantine protocol alongside treatment for scab. Then we've got the strategies that mean we shouldn't have to worm so much at all. Let's talk about nematodirus, for example. We've done a video on this. We can use grazing strategies to mean that when your nematodirus eggs are hatching and the larvae are becoming infective on the pasture, your susceptible lambs are grazing somewhere else. Breaks the cycle between them and it means that we avoid having to worm them. We can do co-grazing with cattle. I know that this is easier said than done a lot of the time. It's not always practical, but actually having cattle that will eat and kill some of the sheep parasites and the sheep that are eating and killing some of the cattle parasites means that we get a general dilution of the infective load on the pasture. And then we can look at things like herbal lays. The anthelmintic effect of herbal lays is very well demonstrated. Some of the plants available within herbal lay mixes do have naturally anthelmintic properties. Some of them are also taller, which means it's more difficult for worm larvae to climb up to the top questing level and get eaten. The broadleaf species in some of these mixes also have a bit of an umbrella effect and they'll keep a dry patch underneath them. Where the earth is dry, it's more difficult for worm larvae to get out of the egg, get out of the dung heap and migrate to where they'll be eaten. So there are a lot of reasons why something like a herb or lay is very good for natural parasite control. Now, lastly, I want to talk about breeding for the ability not to have to worm your lambs. Now, this ties in with what we said earlier about not worming lambs that have still got a good daily live weight gain, even though they're carrying a moderate worm burden. There are some lambs that will still grow despite having worms on board. So we can look for those lambs. We can think, are they ones that we actually want to keep as replacements? Now, we can go a step further than this and actually test your lambs, your potential replacement ewe lambs, to see whether they're likely to be naturally resilient to worms. And this is something that we can test for using saliva samples or even better, blood samples, to show whether these lambs are likely to be able to hold that good daily live weight gain despite carrying worms. And that is a heritable trait. It's something that is desirable in a replacement animal. So there's a lot of information there, and I would urge you to go and have a look at the Scots guidance on responsible use of wormers and responsible control of parasites. I will put a link to it in the description. There may be topics within that that you'd like to explore in more detail. If you do want me to do one of those topics in more detail, please do say so and I will. I hope that video was useful for you and I hope it was interesting. I'll be along with another one very soon. I do hope to see you there. Bye.